we are picking up with the lesson we did last time on instrumental music or Christian worship and the musical aspects of Christian worship. And we finished up on the question, does God forbid the use of instruments of music in worship? And Brother Mike is going to begin this part of this discussion. We will talk about some things people say, what we see in the Old Testament, and what we see in the New Testament with regard to worship. All right, Brother Roger, uh, we're going to pick up the latter part of page 11 in our study material, Does God Forbid the Use of Instruments of Music in Worship?, which is a valid question and fair question. There is much rationalization and use of false logic in attempts to justify the use of instruments of music in worship. Many of the arguments used to favor their use we consider covered adequately by the preceding material. However, there is one argument that is used to which we'll now give attention. It is forcefully declared no one can show one scripture where God specifically forbids the use of instruments of music in worship. Then the advocate boldly concludes, if God does not forbid it, we should not forbid it. And with the superficial Bible student, a point has been made. This false assumption is based on a false approach to Bible study. We do not and cannot conclude that we are at liberty to accept in matters of faith and practice anything that God does not forbid. Silence does not authorize the practice. The Bible nowhere says, thou shalt not burn incense, thou shalt not sprinkle babies, thou shalt not kiss the Pope's ring, thou shalt not offer a lamb sacrifice. Then shall we go ahead and do these things. Scripture and logic exclude these now, but not because the scripture specifically says, thou shalt not do these things. There are other fundamental reasons for excluding these things from worship in the New Testament church. And so, Brother Roger, I think Brother Tucker makes a very valid point. Even though we don't have a uh, thou shalt not use instruments of music in worship, uh, God did not have to specifically make that statement. Because when God said to sing, that logically would exclude everything else. Let me illustrate it in a couple of ways. In Genesis chapter 6, you remember we read of Moses writing about the destruction of the ancient world by means of a, by means of a flood. The reason being that God saw every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was evil. And so God said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, verse 7. And so you remember in verse 8, the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a, uh, he was a blameless man. He walked with God, according to verse 9. And then in verse 13, God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And then in verse 14, God says this to Noah, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. When God specifically told Noah to use gopher wood, then that naturally would have would have excluded every other kind of wood. God didn't have to tell Noah, you can't use pine or oak or cherry or some other type of wood, because when God specified what he wanted, that naturally excluded everything else. We understand that. Uh, we understand that uh, today in many ways. You know, Mike, in in the Hebrews letter where the writer talks about Noah, in verse 7, it says, By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence or godly fear, prepared right. an ark. So when he was building the ark, he was doing it with reverence or respect toward God the way God said do it. That's right. And you know, in Genesis 6, 22, it says, thus did Noah according to all, A-L-L, -L, according to all that God commanded him. And as you pointed out a minute ago, 
faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He did it with reverence for God and his word and his command. What if, what if Noah had built an ark of pine using the same dimensions that God set forth, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high? That ark would not have floated. Why? Because he didn't use the type of wood God said. And, and so when God is specific, then we have to understand that if we're going to be people of faith, we're going to honor what he says. When we apply this principle <laughs> to worship, do we have reverence and respect and fear of God to do what God tells us to do? Or, or if we do it our own way, we're not revering God. That's right. You know, Roger, if, if, uh, yeah, let, let's just imagine that we wanted to buy an automobile and I were to tell you, I'm looking for an automobile. And if you see some, if you see a good deal out there, get it for me or, you know, let me know about it. Well, you would be open to any kind of automobile. But if I said, Roger, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a Chevrolet truck with four doors. Well, if you came back and said, I found you a Ford, well, that wasn't the criteria. You know, I said, I want a Chevrolet truck. If you come back with a Ford or if you come back with a Dodge, then we understand when I specifically said, I want a Chevrolet, that excludes everything else. Right. All right, let's look at another example by way of the Bible. Look over in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 10. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, here's another example of what we're discussing and how it relates to the music issue, the music issue. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, in verse 8, the Bible reads, At that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to him, and to bless in his name to this day. So now we're talking about the priestly tribe. And God had given very specific instructions. Matter of fact, he sets before the children of Israel instructions concerning uh, the Levitical tribe. Well, when God designated or set apart the tribe of Levi to function in this capacity, he didn't have to name all the other tribes, did he, Roger? No, I think what we all need to remember that when God is specific on something, it's his command. It's his plan. It's his purposes that are being carried out. And religion, even beginning with uh, the, the offerings of Cain and Abel throughout the Old Testament and up until today, God has always told us what he wanted us to do. All right. That's and, right. And we're mm -hmm. presumptuous to do something different. That's right. Let me give you one other example before we move on. I think this is a very forceful example. Look over in 2 Samuel chapter 6. You remember when David and the children of Israel transported the ark, and they did so without divine authority. Uh, the text tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 6 that uh, in verse 3, they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments made of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, or held it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez, Uzzah, to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but took it aside 
into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, we have a commentary on this over in 1 Chronicles chapter 15. In 1 Chronicles chapter 15, listen to what the record says concerning the transportation of the ark and the death of Uzzah. You remember in verse 2, well, verse 1, the Bible says, David built houses for himself in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, no one may carry the ark of, the, the ark of God, but whom? The Levites. For the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. They were to use staves and carry it on their shoulders. They weren't to put it on, an, on, an, on, a, on, a, on a cart. And uh, the Bible says that David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. Now drop down and look, at, look if you would, <clears throat> at verse 12. And listen to what David said. You are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I prepared for it. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order, or some translations say the due order. What was David saying? They didn't follow God's divine instructions, and what happened? They paid a heavy price for it. And and you go back to 2 Samuel 6, at, at verse 7, and it says, God struck Uzzah struck him down for his error. The New American Standard says for his irreverence. Okay. He did not respect and revere God. And had God told them how to carry the ark. That's right. That's what, right. And he, this is a very good example of, well, this will work. It And even if the ark had not fallen to the ground, even though Uzzah touched it, that's not what God said to do. That's right. Look at look at the continuation. In verse 14, the Bible says, So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel, and the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles. Now listen to this. As Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. So God had specified how they were tr to transport that ark. Because they failed to do it God's way, they pay they paid a price for that. And and so I think that by way of analogy, this is the same thing that we're talking about with regard to the instrument. Anything that God tells us to do should be respected to the letter. That's right. That's uh, right. It's after all. Who designed the ark? Not Noah's ark, but who designed the ark? Of, God did. He told them how to build it. He told them how to construct it. Then he tells them if you, and of course the, the tabernacle was a movable worship tent. And so when you move it, this is the way you do it. And That's okay. even the design of the of the tabernacle and all of the furnishings and the priesthood, like you mentioned, all this came from God. That's right. It had to do with worship. That's right. And you know, a new Testament, I, I think a correlation to everything that we're talking about is found over in the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter seven in the book of Hebrews. One of the things that the writer is establishing is the high priesthood of Christ, that he is our great high priest. Well, Jesus did not come from the priestly tribe of Levi, right? but rather he came from the tribe of Judah. And so if the Lord were to be a priest and function in that capacity, sanctioned by God, he couldn't do it according to the Mosaic economy because there was no authority for it. So look at what the writer says in Hebrews chapter uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, of necessity there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken before, or rather belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. 
For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Well, Moses, when Moses talked about the priesthood and those who functioned in that capacity, they came from the tribe of Levi. Right. And so for the Lord to be a high priest today and function at, in that capacity, uh, he came from a different tribe, so there had to be a change of the law. And the writer said that Moses said nothing about that. This is an example that we'll come to in a few minutes of the law of silence. That's right. That's exactly right. So God didn't say anything about it. And so, you you know, it's if God doesn't say something, that doesn't mean I have the right to do something on my own. I don't I know, think that's, I that's don't know great, if I'm wording that the best. No, but, I think that that's, that's right. Um, uh, and you know what we're, you know, we're not, we're not going to take the time to read uh, the next two or three paragraphs, but I think it's important for us to remember just by way of summary, and you can go back and read this when you have the time, but our goal is to restore or replicate New Testament Christianity. And, and so our goal is to go back and try to do Bible things in Bible ways. And if you go back to the first century church, uh, it is evident that in the first century, they that they sang, they did not use any type of instrumental music. And the reason that they did not use it was because it wasn't authorized. When, when you look at the difference in the Reformation movement, the Reformation movement was a reforming of Catholicism. It was not uh, Luther's approach was not to go back to the New Testament and see what they did, but they were trying to fix Catholicism. That's right. And, and, and but the restoration approach is what? The restoration approach is, let's go all the way back to the beginning, which Martin Luther, his, as you said a minute ago, the goal was to reform what he thought uh, to be uh, problems within the Catholic Church. Well, the Catholic Church is not is not the authorized church. The Catholic Church is the apostate church. They apostatized, uh, and it began in the uh, organizational structure, and then it dovetailed out from there. But our goal is to go back and to restore New Testament Christianity. Roger, I know that that you like old cars. I like old cars, and. Uh, you had a GTO, a GTO. Well, I've seen some cars. I've seen, you know, we've both seen cars that are considered classics today. And there are some automobiles that in their original state, they didn't have, they didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have uh, CD players or anything like that. Now you could go back and try to restore that car, but if you're going to restore it to its original condition, then it has to be just like it was when it came off the showroom floor. And by the same token, when we talk about restoring the New Testament church, we're trying to go back and do things exactly like they did. And if you notice this paragraph statement that I've highlighted, the restoration approach is like to restore. So I've been looking at buying an older car and the car I was looking at came with an AM FM radio. Well, if I bought that car and I put in a new radio that would accept Sirius FM or whatever, it would still be that car, but it would not be as it was as the company built it. It wouldn't be original. And you can do that with a car, but you can't do that with the Lord's church. That's right. That's right. And, and really, Roger, what we're saying is that there is a pattern. I know that there are some people today that they don't like the idea of a pattern. I remember one preacher who said, I reject pattern theology. Well, the fact of the matter is the Bible is a blueprint or a pattern. When Paul wrote in Romans 6 and said, you obeyed from the heart, that form or pattern, there's a pattern, you know, and I mean, you know, we can kick, scream, say we don't like it, but that doesn't change the truth. So if you look at the paragraph here and their approach, it's like, okay, what is our hermeneutic? We'll do a different lesson on it, but what we do is by direct command, or example, a setting a precedent or a necessary inference. 
because the Bible does not, if the, if we had a list of all the do's and don'ts, oh my, what we do in Christianity, I don't know that anybody would have a room big enough to hold the material. I agree. And then you'd be digging through it. Well, let's see, we didn't find that one, so I guess that's okay. But if the Bible tells us what to do by command, or if you have an example of what was done or something is implied as the way it to be done, you know, I want to bring this up again. Uh, we mentioned it in the last lesson, but in Jesus' discussion with the woman of Samaria, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The attitude and then the truth. Well, where is the, if we must worship God in truth, where do you find that truth? It's certainly not in my opinion, because when it comes to opinions, one man's opinion is good as another's. But when it comes, if Jesus cannot tell us to do something in truth, if we don't have the truth regarding that particular. That's a great point, Roger. Verse. That's a great point. And you know what? That that word must is an obligation. It's an imperative. It is. And there is a parallel to that back in John 3, when Jesus said in John 3, verse 7, marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. Well, that's an, that's an obligation. And so, you know, this, this is not something that's just left to our discretion. Well, we have a, a sector of people, not only in the church, but outside the Lord's church that do not believe in the, what we call the CENI hermeneutic, command, example, necessary inference. I have studied it. I've analyzed it. And I can't find anything else that works that will bring us to the conclusions of truth. And you do not have instruments, as we okay. mentioned in our last lesson, we have no uh, command from the, from the Lord. We have no sanction of the apostles. We have no example of the New Testament church using it. And then we talked about when the years, you know, how many years later it was until they began to be used. And, and I don't want to rehash that lesson, but I want to talk about this in this paragraph where the use of instruments in Christian worship is dangerous, divisive, deadly, and devastating to the body of Christ. And I wanted to go to, to John 17, verses 20 and 21. Um, Jesus is Lord. Jesus' words, as we mentioned in our last lesson will be the standard of judgment john 12 and verse 48 when jesus prayed and this and john's the only one who records this uh it's it's about the time of uh, when before he was arrested but he he had a prayer and the apostles heard it and we see in verse verse 20 john 17 i do not ask on behalf of these alone talking about the apostles but for those also who believe on me through their word that is the word of the apostles that they may all be one even as you father are in me and i in you that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me and jesus did not pray a vain prayer we can be one if we will follow what the New Testament teaches. And, and adding anything to the worship or tampering with the doctrine of salvation uh, or the leadership of the church, you change what the New Testament teaches, it, it will inevitably cause division. Why do we have so many churches? Because men have added or taken away from the teaching of the New Testament and it divides it and it goes, it's diametrically opposed to Jesus' prayer. And Roger, if you would, since you mentioned John 17, I, I, I wish you'd go to 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verse 10, and, and deal with the division that existed in Corinth and note specifically what, Paul said uh, the way to the way to eradicate that division. 
Well, of course, the the problem in Corinth is they were following different preachers and giving credence to them. Verse 12 says, "Some each one of you is saying, I'm of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. And Paul asked a rhetorical question, has Christ been divided? Uh, and so then you go back up here, though, and of course, that's a vital question. Are we, has Christ been divided? Now, I exhort you, verse 10, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree or y'all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. The New Testament is inspired of God. All scripture is inspired of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16. And so I, it comes down to if it's worship or the plan of salvation, organization of the church, it comes back to respect and reverence for the word of God. We either respect it or we don't. That's right. And, and you know, Roger, what you read a minute ago from John 17, where Jesus prayed for unity uh, through the apostles' words, in 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul said, you know, there's not to be division, but that the goal is to all speak the same thing. And the, uh, there's only one standard, as you pointed out, John 12, 48. If we're going to follow the standard, the question is, are we going to follow the standard or are we going to follow what other people have said? Are we so selfish? Is that really the problem? Well, I like the instruments in worship, somebody says. I understand why they like it, okay? I do. If it's well done, from a human perspective, it's it's pretty. But we're not in the business of entertaining God, but to worship God right. or to entertain one another. Worship is never was never designed for our entertainment. I like to watch good instrumental music in the secular uh, field of music. There are some people that play, so boy, I wish I could play like that. And and that has its place. But we're not talking about going to a concert or listening to something on YouTube or whatever to be entertained. We People need to learn to separate entertainment from worship. That's right. What pleases me. One of the reasons more people aren't saved is because they're interested in pleasing themselves. That's right. Roger, if you would, maybe, I know we talked about this before we began, but you mentioned Colossians 2 about wheel worship or uh, self-imposed worship. In other words, it's what I like. That's what I'm going to do. Well, you know, the early church had its challenges just like the church does today. And in principle, some of them were the same. The practices may have been a little different. There was a lot of idolatry in the early church. There was worship of angels that I guess some people do today. I don't know. But he talks about that. But he talks about uh, the commandments and teachings of men in verse 22 of Colossians 2. And of course, that's opposed to the commandments and teachings of God. He says, these are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom. That's the way the New American Standard reads. In the self-made religion, or how did the New King James read there? Uh, self-imposed. Self-imposed religion. What does that mean? What is self-made or self-imposed? That means that I have done something with my religion toward God based on maybe human tradition. Something goes back for years, but it's not based on scripture or this makes me feel better or whatever. Paul is, is condemning that. Right. Self-made I... religion. And it's not just worship. It's anything we do for God. Yeah, and you know, Paul there is simply saying that, you know, here's somebody who is imposing his will in that realm. You know, you know what? You our, know, Bibles, that... our Bibles didn't come in books, chapters, and verses. That's right. Go into chapter three, Paul says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep speak, seeking those things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things above, not on things that are on the earth. 
what does he mean, Mike, by things that are above? What's that? Well, I think he's not. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, what does that mean? I think it's. I. Th I think that we're we're trying to follow heaven's law, heaven's will, and that we're we're looking at things from a spiritual perspective rather than a secular, which is what you mentioned a moment ago. There's a difference in the secular and the spiritual. And you come back to this question, regardless of what it is, if something is not in our New Testaments, it's dangerous to start of trying to teach something that's not there. It's divisive. And it's caused the religious division that we see today. Am I willing, as a lover of God, as a lover of Jesus Christ, as a lover of truth, is what I'm doing potentially going to cause division in the body of Christ, especially if there's no biblical support for it? I would not want to stand before the Lord and say, well, you know, I really like that, Lord. And I and I was, it just made me feel better. And I know it caused division, but I feel better about it. That is self-imposed religion. It is. It is. You know, the, you know, back at the turn of the century, the, the, the Lord's Church split over this very issue. Well, uh, music. We, we do not dislike beautiful music. That's not what this is about. The, the, the explanation that we have of, of singing in the New Testament, it's designed to teach one another, Colossians 3.16, Ephesians 5.19, and to speak to God. God is the one on the throne. God is the authority. Uzzah was stricken because he did not respect and revere the will of God. And, you know, David played a part in it. I mean, you know, sure. late, later, you know, he was, you see what happened. Somebody says, well, why did God strike him dead? Because he violated God's will with regard to something uh, sacred. And, and, and you know, Roger, worship I, is a I, sacred activity. And, and, and I know that our time is coming to a close, but, you know, sadly, you and I, we've, we've discussed it before, but we, we have brethren today that have opened the door and, and quite frankly, have brought the instrument into their worship services. Uh, I can think of uh, two churches off the top of my head right now, one in Nashville, one in Memphis, that they're now using the instrument in one of their services. Well, I think we need to be very clear. To do that is to engage in apostasy. It is an apostasy. We're, we're, we're talking about people moving away from that now that divine paradigm or para pattern. And as a result of that, uh, you know, we're, we're out of fellowship with those people. You might want to take a minute uh, to explain why we're out of fellowship. And does that mean we <laughs> dislike those people or have hatred? No, but, if a person has not done what the Bible says to do to be saved, they are not in fellowship with God. They're That's still right. in their sins. They're still dead in their sins. When it comes to worship, if let me, let's go back to first Corinthians one for just a moment. What potentially would have happened in Corinth if Paul had not addressed that issue? What would have happened? There would have been division. Have been. There already was division in the works because some said, well, you know, following men, Apollos or Cephas or Peter or Paul. And, and Paul asked the question, is Christ divided? And then and, and the focus is, you know, that Paul was thankful he didn't baptize anybody. That he didn't he didn't keep a record. So, well, I baptized. And look at all these people I baptized. I really should have the most followers. And the he kept pointing people to Christ. And 
if they had followed that pattern, which people are doing today, it's amazing to me at the people that will follow preachers. And they, right. and they never check the book to see if what that preacher is saying is true. Right. Well, he, you know, he, well, he must be right. He's had all this education. And if we don't get our education from scripture, we're, un we're not, we're uneducated. That's right. And we're, and we should never follow men because right. men are fallible. And I want to say this before we wrap this up today. The people in the churches of Christ who are sincerely seeking to do the will of God, we're not trying to get you to follow us. That's right. We're trying to get people to do what the Bible says to do. Exactly right. And Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's right. And even then he was praying that the Lord would protect the apostles from potential apostasy. You know, they were fallible. They were inspired, but they were also flesh and blood and, and they could have fallen by the wayside themselves. And so he prayed about that. And if we will do what the Bible teaches, somebody says, well, I'm not, I'm not ever going to use an instrument uh, and I'm not going, you know, I'm not sure whether it's sinful or not. And, and I know some people like that. Fair enough. But don't you dare divide the body of Christ over your human opinion. Yeah. You know, um, we, we may raise the question, well, what about people who've never heard the gospel? Well, the Lord will judge those people. The Lord will judge them. And yet we know what a person must do to be saved. They must hear the gospel of Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In Romans 17, verse 17, Jesus told the Jews in John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And he repeated it. Christ must be accepted as the one and only savior. And we must confess him before men, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Or either if we confess him, Jesus says, I'll confess you before my father. If you deny me, I'll deny you before my father. And then we must repent. The people on Pentecost who were guilty of killing Jesus and all their other sins had to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And that's what, the, and they were. Some 3,000 of them were. And verse 47 says, the Lord was adding to their number, adding to the church daily, those who were being saved. And that's what the Bible teaches. We change that. We're tampering with the will of God and do the same thing when it comes to worship. That's right. That's right. Uh, Roger, you mentioned something just before closing about fellowship and the danger of apostasy. In 2 John 9, John said, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So what he's saying there is if we're not willing to abide in the doctrine of Christ, in the teaching of Christ, then that relationship has been severed. In verse 10, he said, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. Now, some people have said that what John was talking about was the, the teaching of uh, the teaching about Christ. And then there are those that say, well, it's the teaching of Christ. I think you can make the case it's both had to do with the teaching about Christ and the teaching of Christ uh, because they're both important. And we mentioned that last time. That's right. I want, so, I want to leave, the, leave our thoughts with this question. Let's say a person has studied this and they're genuine, they're sincere. The Bible clearly tells us in Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3, 16 to sing and make melody in the heart. That's not the blood pump. That's the spirit, your inner person to sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's clear to me. Am I willing? If somebody says, well, you know, I'm just not sure about the instrumental music. Fair enough. If they're not to the point they're fully convinced, keep studying it, keep studying it. But am I willing to divide the precious body of Christ over something that's not there? 
that's not commanded or something that I'm not sure about? Or do I want to keep the unity of the body of Christ because the Bible tells us how to worship? And there will always be questions we we struggle with, but we should never divide the Lord's church, even if we're not certain about it yet, keep studying it. And, and that's what we encourage people to do, isn't it, Mike, to study these things? That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, because, you know, as you mentioned, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And the only way that we're going to know the will of God is to, to study. Uh, you know, we've got to just spend time and study, and we want to make sure that when it's all said and done, we come down on the side of truth. I do know this. Singing and making melody in your heart or singing with grace in your heart to the Lord makes God happy. He is pleased with that, and I ought to be satisfied with it. That's right. That's exactly right. Let, let me just read for you something that I thought about this. Brother Basil Barrett Baxter wrote a book many years ago, and the title of the book is Family of God. And I remember when we were in school, Roger, we used this book as a textbook some years back. But he said, the basic reason why we do not believe in the use of mechanical instruments to accompany the singing in Christian worship is that we find no authorization for such usage in the New Testament. We genuinely love God and want to do his will. Therefore, we want to be very sure that we stay within the bounds of his authorization when we worship him. We can be sure that worshiping without instruments is approved. Because it, because it is the way the apostles worship. This is the safe, sure way. We do not feel that we have the right to authorize that which might be pleasing to our own taste, but that for which we cannot find scriptural authorization. I thought he said it well. That book, by the way, is still in print. And when I finish the video, uh, I will post a link for it on uh, on our youtube channel we appreciate everyone listening today we went longer than we intended to but that's all right uh, our next discussion this is part two and i will have another part we may have as many as three uh this says part two but we're going to look at a piece by jack p lewis about acapella singing and in that we will look at old testament examples and we'll also look at the New Testament teaching on it. And we'll refer to some of the Old Testament examples of instruments in worship and dig into this deeper. Uh, this material is available uh, in a PDF for any who want it. We will specifically send it to our International Academy of Biblical Studies students. And uh, we do have a way for you to comment on this video. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson that you're seeing on the screen, just comment and get us an email address and we'll be happy to share it with you.